Hello and welcome to Quadrilla's latest webcast and thank you very much indeed for all the interest you're showing in the operations at Preston New Road. We had over 20,000 hits on our February webcast and you can join in again by entering your questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Just to remind you that Quadrilla is a Lancashire-based company exploring for shale gas three and a half kilometres below the surface at Preston New Road. Today we're going to get a progress report on operations, particularly in relation to horizontal drilling, which makes this project unique in the United Kingdom. But we're also going to explore the business and commercial and job opportunities for the whole Lancashire economy with a range of guests. But first of all, my first guest, and I'm delighted to say, is a return visit for Laura Hughes, who's Quadrilla's Head of Commercial and Supply Chain. You're also a chemical engineer, a drilling expert, and you'll be answering people's questions later on. But first of all, let's get a progress report on where we are at the moment. So we're currently well underway drilling the first horizontal section of our first well. We'll then be moving on to the second well, completing that before we have the fracturing and then the well test operations. So things are going good and steady and we're, we're very pleased uh, um, with the results so far. Because this horizontal drilling really does make this a unique project, doesn't it? In the UK and in the shale industry, yes. Horizontal drilling, obviously very well established in the industry, but it's a first for the UK onshore. OK, now let's look at the benefits for the Lancashire economy, because that's mm. a bit of our theme today. Um, what, what benefits have been achieved so far, would you say? Well, very specifically to Quadrilla's business, we've moved our headquarters here as the first start. We're, we're a Lancashire-based business. It makes sense for us to anchor ourselves here in a sustainable way. That gives us access to the, the local economy and the local supply, giving us a good value for money and, and quick response time to, to support our business. So in general, you know, that, that was the first step that, uh, that we made. The way in which we do our business is we've made a description of that in a, a um, commitment, a set of commitments that we entered into um, as, we, as we started our operation and in that we talk about the value generally of shale gas to uh, energy security, we talk about the way in which we're going to conduct our operations, so the safety standards uh, to which we're going to operate and we talk uh, in a number of ways about the way in which we uh, benefit and interact with the local economy and supply chain. So what sort of goods and services have been actually supplied so far by local companies? It'll just give us a sort of sense of where the commercial opportunities are. Really. Yeah, so there's a whole a whole range, some that are sort of people will be familiar as general business support, so cleaning services, office supplies, things like that, and then some that are more sort of general industry supplies, so plant hire, generator hire, um, engineering support, things like that. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, behind us here we've actually got uh, some information on what you call your tracker, that's your tracker of local commitments to the Lancashire economy, so let's have a look at that and see what it tells us. So yes, this is how we are quantifying and then communicating how we're putting those commitments into practice. So at the top, we're talking about the number of positions and the jobs within the company. We've got over 50 positions being created in our business. We then move on to looking at how much money has gone to the local contractors, the local supply chain, both in direct spend, so that's people with whom we directly contract, and then the companies with whom they subcontract. Um, that at the uh, end of December was around £7 million, where we are now, obviously, well through the first quarter of the year, that's now well in excess of that £7 million mark. Um, and at the bottom we're talking about the money that we've put into the local economy through and the local um, communities through sponsorships um, and community benefit schemes and that's in excess of uh, £300,000 now that's gone to the local communities. And on the right hand side here we've got the number of companies who are registered on the supply chain portal that we run with the, uh, both of the Lancashire Chambers of Commerce and that's the, the tool that we use to be able to access local businesses when we're looking for goods and services. Going back to that £7 million plus figure that you were talking about earlier on, I mean, is that a, an indicator of what we can look forward to in the future? Well, that's showing what we can do when we have a work programme of two wells, um, subject obviously to the success um, of these first two horizontal wells and showing uh, the viability of shale gas, then there are much broader opportunities for us to put these uh, commitments into practice 
Lancashire has a, a great history of embracing new industry. I mean, we've seen how they've embraced aerospace and, and nuclear in the past, and really strong industrial heritage. And so that these uh, the ability for the uh, the economy to respond to this new business opportunity is vast. But questions still remain about the, this operation, whether it's necessary or not. And some people point to the success of renewable energy. Well, absolutely. A renewable energy in a low carbon economy is the vision of the future. But we need energy for much more than just electricity generation. Right now, eight out of ten homes in the UK use gas for heating and cooking. Um, National Grid, who uh, manage the uh, gas transmission network in the UK, have just published their vision uh, and their analysis of the future of gas looking out to 2050. And they've concluded that in all um, foreseeable scenarios, so even the ones in which renewables and electrical cars, for example, make the most gains, then gas has a very significant and very important part of meeting that low carbon economy uh, strategy. So there is a requirement for gas. And of course it's very pertinent with the recent cold snap. We saw gas prices go up to 10 year highs, five times what we would expect as an average gas price. And for the first time in almost a decade, uh, National Grid had to put out warnings around the fact that we couldn't import enough gas into the UK to meet our requirements. On two days, we were using more gas than we could physically get into the country regardless of the price that we were willing to pay. So it is a reality that we have a, an energy, real energy crisis in the country. We have a natural gas source underneath our feet that could step into that gap and give us the energy security. So there really is a very strong case for trying to make this a reality. And, and Lancashire can be at the heart of this. This is your main message, is it? Well, the ball and shale is under our feet. Quadrilla are drilling the first two horizontal wells in the UK, as we said. We are at the forefront of exploring and trying to demonstrate how well we can, uh, we can do the operations and, and de demonstrate the viability, so prove the concept. And we'll be, you know, we'll be in the position for that by the end of this year. And indeed, then, Lancashire, as we said, they have the industrial heritage, we've got the skills, we've got the enthusiasm, uh, and we're really going to be able to, uh, to respond. And I would say that it's beyond really just looking in Lancashire to, to the Lancashire business. The Bowl and Shale, we think, is running across, well, we know the Bowl and Shale runs across the north of the UK. We could be the hub for the whole of the development of that, uh, that uh, industry. I could maybe just sneak in a quick story about, about Aberdeen, of course, because very much uh, Aberdeen is now associated with being the supply hub for the North Sea and international oil and gas. But it wasn't always the case. Um, when oil was discovered in the North Sea in the 1970s, before my time, I have to say... Not mine, sadly, was, I'm <laughs> You might remember that. <laughs> yes, indeed. There was a... <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, all the goods and services had to come from the US, essentially. So there were American companies that came in, but there were some focused, industrious um, Scottish um, businessmen, entrepreneurs, who went over to the US, understood the goods and services that those companies were providing, brought that back and started building that uh, supply hub in Aberdeen. And, and look what that has then done for that city and the anchor that that has been. So we've got the opportunity to do that in Lancashire as well. Laura, thanks very much for now. You'll be back later on. But uh, we're now off to meet a person who actually wants to grasp some of those opportunities that Laura's been talking about for the Lancashire economy. I've now come to Preston Docks to join Lee Petts from the Lancashire for Shale organisation and uh, quite an historic site this Lee, give us a brief up some. Uh, yeah it's, um, it's a really fascinating history that, uh, that it's got actually. So it was developed in the late 19th century and was very much at the heart of Lancashire's industrial revolution. So just up the, uh, up the river from us we would see boats of coal and, and timber and, and all sorts of other things brought in down the river uh, and into this which at the time was one of Europe's biggest inland ports. Uh, and on the back of that we saw a huge uh, huge growth in local industry, so um, a, a coal tar distillery that was developed here that was taking coal from uh, or coke from the local uh, gasifiers and the uh, and the local power station 
turning that into coal tar chemicals and then selling those chemicals into the timber treatment company on the docks and so on. So you created this whole sort of codependent ecosystem, if you like, of, uh, of local businesses. It's well, really fascinating. That's historic industry. We're now uh, sort of bringing the industrial story up to date. And tell us about what the organisation Lancashire for Shale is all about. So Lancashire Shale is busy now uh, engaging with the Lancashire business community, uh, helping them to understand the size and scale of the potential opportunity that shale gas could bring to, uh, to Lancashire and helping to prepare them for the opportunities that might lie ahead. And how are you doing that? Meeting them and briefings, that sort of thing? Yes, so we hold regular uh, meetings and uh, presentation events for different sectors. So last year we, uh, we held... Uh, presentation evenings for the professional services sector, so consultants, accountants and so on, uh, manufacturing, engineering and for the tourism and hospitality sector. So it's about getting out into the business community uh, and telling them uh, what the opportunities are and how they can get involved in those opportunities. There was a very important gathering recently, the Lancashire Business Expo. How did that go? That was absolutely fantastic. So it's the first time that we've exhibited like that uh, at a very public uh, business gathering that we haven't had control of ourselves um, and it was fantastic literally all day we were inundated with local business people uh, joining us on the stand asking us about the opportunities talking to us very positively about shale uh, lots of people articulating very positive support for, for shale gas in Lancashire it was really uh, really worthwhile doing actually. In the recent cold weather we were made very much aware of the narrow margins that we're on in terms of gas supply. What can you say about that? Uh, I think it's um, it's no way to run a country is it to be so dependent on energy from overseas which is the position we're in at the moment with over, <laughs> well, well over half our gas already imported and, and a number of uh, liquefied natural gas shipments from Russia to uh, to keep our heating going in uh, in recent times um, I liken it to your, your home you know you wouldn't run your central heating radiators on next door's gas boiler uh, for for many reasons not least of which because if they decided to turn the uh, the heating off for some reason you'd be sat there shivering in the cold well that's kind of the situation we're in now with this dependency we have on our uh, our overseas neighbors um, and we are at the very end of the european gas distribution network so when it's cold on the continent and, and everybody starts using more gas the flows to the uk start to drop uh, so it's no position for us to be in, especially when we're sat on this abundance of gas under our own feet here in Lancashire. Can I turn to this important issue that people are concerned about, which is the number of employment opportunities here in Lancashire? I mean, do you want to put a figure on it? Do you want to talk about it? I mean, what, what have we got to do to ensure that the local economy really benefits? Uh, I think it's too early to put uh, a definitive figure on how many jobs we might see come to uh, to Lancashire, but I actually think it's, it's the wrong way of looking at the question. What we should be asking ourselves is how do we maximise the number of jobs that we create here? Uh, and that's very much what Lancashire Shale is all about. Uh, and we do that by, as I say, engaging with businesses and preparing them for the opportunities that will come along because then they might be able to employ more people uh, and making sure that we are ready from a skills perspective so we've got Blackpool and Fylde College for instance engaging now to try and make sure that local people have the right skills that they'll need for uh, for success in this industry. So it's a little bit about well, how many jobs you actually want because if you want them let's create the environment for it to actually happen. Absolutely we've got to create the conditions for, uh, for success uh, and that means everybody in the business community getting behind this whether they've got skin in the game as a potential supplier or not you know um, anything that boosts the local economy will be good for all businesses in this area lee thank you very much indeed well now it's time for our first question and answer session with laura hughes laura and i are now outside here at preston new road to answer the first round of your questions and the first one comes from a previous topic we discussed on pnr live which is your uh, uh, application to get surface water discharge permits how's that going oh yeah that's right so what we wanted to do was to get a permit to be able to in times of heavy rainfall store the water on the site and then once the uh, water levels have subsided to be able to discharge the water at a controlled rate locally that would mean that we wouldn't be moving rainwater off site in tankers so that application has been made and is still under consideration by the environment agency now uh, the recent cold weather the beast from the east i'm not <laughs> sure it's entirely gone to be absolutely honest uh, laura but how did that affect operations here well 
Drilling operations are designed to continue whatever the weather, so what we have to do is make sure that the people working on site are comfortable, they're properly clothed, they've got a nice working environment to go in, and so they're, you know, they're able to continue to execute their jobs uh, safely and comfortably, but really the drilling went on uninterrupted. Uh, the next question is, is really quite a central one, really, is, and it's about hydraulic fracking. Um, I mean, obviously, there are unique aspects about it here, but uh, the question is asking, you know, how common is it generally and how safe is it? So quite a, a, a broad question. I think we'll need quite a full answer from you on this <laughs> yeah. one. Well, many wells that are drilled for the extraction of oil or gas require some additional um, stimulation to help the fluids flow to surface. So hydraulic fracturing is one of those techniques. It's very well established across the globe um, for shale operations, but also in conventional reservoirs as well. Um, so it is, it is well established and it's quite common in, in uh, drilling and well terms. Um, in terms of how safe it is, well, maybe if you split it down into it, its component pieces. So we're using water and a, a single non-toxic additive um, for the for the fluid that we're using. Um, we're using sand, which is just really like sand off the beach. Um, it's a, a, a pumping operation, a high pressure pumping operation. Again, a well established, I guess, industrial process um, that has to be managed, and, but, but is well understood. And, and there's lots of established uh, procedures for conducting that. Um, we have the downhole monitoring of the fracturing, so we can watch in real time how the how the fractures are moving through the rock. So, you know, in terms of all those component pieces, I think when you break it down, when you understand it, you know, it, it is actually all quite sort of normal and understandable different parts of the process. A, a follow-up question, I suppose, to that. Um, this is about the water that's going to come back up the well. I mean, what's going to happen with that? Yeah, so once we put the water into into the well, um, at the time we're ready to start uh, flowing the gas, yes, some of that water will come back out. Because that water has been in contact with the rock, and that's the bowl and shale that we talked about previously, which, which is our reservoir here, but it's the same rocks that we walk amongst when we're up in the fells here. It, we imagine that the water will have picked up some of the mineralogy uh, and some of the... the, the parts I suppose, physical parts of the rock. Um, so when it comes back to surface we will uh, we'll test it to understand what the chemical composition of that is. It could be that there are um, very low levels of naturally occurring radiation in that water as well so we'll measure that so that we understand exactly what's in that fluid and then that will be transported off-site um, by licensed carriers to facilities that are used to treating wastewater. The next question I think is going to put you on the spot and it's when do you actually expect gas to be flowing from this site? Oh, well, we'll have gas uh, to surface, I think, by the end of the year um, for, for the, the testing on site. Yes. And, and I, I suppose a follow-up question for me is um, when do you expect that gas to sort of flow into the, the national grid? Because gas does have a grid like electricity, does it? Yeah, yeah, yes, it does. We've got a kind of a, a high-pressure spine down the country that then goes into all of the local gas distribution networks in the different regions of the country. Um, the planning permission that we have here for this site covers a connection from the site to our local gas distribution network. Uh, so once we've done the, the testing, the initial testing on the site, then we will be hooking up the, the Preston New Road pad to the local gas distribution network and that gas will be flowing to the Lancashire homes as we carry on with our testing operations. Oh, I see. So this gas will be lanky gas in that sense. It'll be used locally. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to go to the Lancashire homes first. Oh, yes. I, see. I, I thought it was going to it would, it would contribute to the national gas supply, but I suppose uh, the, this there'll be extra gas available yeah. for the rest of the country because yeah be not ultimately to use gas in action yeah ultimately it's part of the same mix but uh, our gas molecules are going to be going to lancashire homes first yes um in this webcast we're hearing from chambers of commerce and uh, uh, and, and suppliers about how they can get involved with quadrilla in the local economy and what's quadrilla's perspective on that well as i as i was saying earlier um 
you know, it, our supply base um, primarily has to be a Lancashire business. That helps us be sustainable and, uh, and that helps us with the, the best quality of the supply and, and, and the best turnaround time. So um, what we're doing is working with the, uh, the local business community through the Chambers of Commerce, through the Lancashire for Shale business group to, to connect with a supply chain. So that's where all of our procurement and all of our business starts. On that subject, I mean, what are you actually looking for from suppliers? So the first, of course, is the, the, the right mixture of products and services. Um, they have to be able to operate to the right standards for the oil and, uh, oil and gas industry. So we're looking for businesses that are, are well established and have got the management systems and the evidence in place to know that they can provide us with the quality that we need for our operation. So how, how is Quadrilla interacting and in, in sort of promoting opportunities for suppliers? Well, um, I think that you know the, the primary route for contact is through the uh, supplier portal. So businesses register online at uh, www.shaleforlancashire. No, sorry, shalegaslancashire.co.uk. Um, so they register on that on the portal and tell us about the services and the goods that they can provide, and then we use that uh, that list when we're looking to buy things. Um, a question coming in about this flow rate, because um, you know, that's obviously ultimately important. Uh, and commercial viability is, is, is a key point here. Okay. I think that's what this question's about. How do you determine that it's commercially viable? Oh, so that, that's a, a, a great and very complicated question. And so I suppose um, there's probably three components. One is the actual flow rate of the gas. So we're looking for a good sustained flow rate of gas from a, an individual well. Um, the second component is how much it costs to get the gas to surface. So building our um, understanding and building our experience of drilling and fracturing so that we can drive down the costs uh, of each well. And then the third component would be gas price. You know, we have to have a view of a, a, a stable and long-term gas price that you know fits into the mix and all those three components together will then determine whether a project, a, a development project is commercially viable. And at that stage, what uh, this question I think is about what this site will actually look like at that time? So, um, currently we have got planning... I mean, the rig won't be here, presumably. No, exactly. We've got uh, planning permission for four wells on this site. So in the short term, we'll drill those four wells. The rig will have gone, um, the uh, fracturing equipment will have gone. We'll have some small-scale, low-lying processing, gas conditioning equipment and measurement. Um, and so, you know, yeah, the, there won't really be very much of note on this site. Um, you know, the, the future potential for the site, I think, depends very much on, on what we see in our first four wells. Uh, a question from Lancashire for Shale, which is an organisation that's uh, supporting this project, and I think it's about the sort of skills that are being acquired here uh, to uh, also be used in Quadrilla's overseas operations. Is, uh, is there other opportunities there? Um, it's probably the other way around. Uh, Quadrilla doesn't have any international operations. We are um, entirely focused on uh, on the UK. We've got licences here in Lancashire um, and over on the eastern side of the country. But I think that interaction with the international industry probably is more an opportunity for Quadrilla and for people from Lancashire. I think there'll be lots of people from the county um, who've gone overseas um, to, to participate in the oil and gas industry internationally and, uh, and shale gas here is going to provide the opportunity for them to bring their skills home uh, and, and put them to use amongst their, uh, amongst their yeah, where they want to be. Uh, amongst your many responsibilities is this whole question of the supply chain. Um, I mean, the jobs aren't just sort of jobs for uh, quadrilla directly are they there are a lot of other people can you sort of estimate the number of jobs that might be created throughout the supply chain it's quite difficult to do that and there have been I think a number of studies that have pointed to the ability to create thousands of jobs through the supply chain it, it depends very much I, I think on again on the results of these first four wells and our testing activity to know how things are going to scale up I mean what I can say is you know in Quadrilla coming in and establishing our headquarters here we've created over 50 jobs in our company alone 
and the normal contractual strategy for um, for gas operations will be quite a small client company and the majority of uh, jobs and the uh, and employment is in the supply chain so it really is just the tip of the iceberg um, but exactly what that number is going to be is difficult to know um, before we've actually completed the testing component. Laura, thanks very much indeed. We're going to give you a well-earned rest for a little bit because uh, we're now going to talk to some people who are absolutely crucial to Laura's supply chain. That's the Chambers of Commerce. These are the offices of the North and Western Lancashire Chamber of Commerce. They keep an eye on the local economy and are supporting this new industry in Lancashire. Let's go inside. With me on my far right is Babs Murphy, who's Chief Executive of the North West Lancashire Chamber of Commerce, and nearest me, Miranda Barker of the East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce. Babs, if I can come to you first of all, why are you backing the shale gas industry in Lancashire? Be simply because of the economic benefits that this industry would bring to Lancashire, and certainly so far as local um, labour and the jobs that th this industry would create. But in addition to that, the opportunities that would be afforded to the business community of Lancashire through a supply chain which currently is being developed. And so it's the economic benefits that what persuaded you? It is. That's very much what Chambers of Commerce are for, is we're there to work on behalf of the whole of our area, all of the companies, all of the businesses. And here in the heartland of the manufacturing centre of the north of England in Lancashire, this is an industry we're well geared to take advantage of. And it's our job as Chambers of Commerce to make sure our members and our local companies have the best opportunity to do that. Well, what have you actually done to help local companies get involved? Well, we believe that to, to, to secure... Uh, first mover advantage for Lancashire, we need to mobilise the business community in preparing them to supply shale gas. And we've done that through a number of measures by, first of all, establishing a, sh a shale gas portal. And over 700 companies now was, are registered on that portal. That affords them information about tenders coming out and news about the industry, so they're getting it first hand. And in addition to that, organising a suite of Meet the Buyers ex um, events, which is, I think, full, full to capacity on each event with a huge waiting list. So the These are the speed dating things, are they? Well, it, it, it's more about those businesses learning from Cadrilla's procurement team the kind of things that Cadrilla will need for future purchasing. Have you done similar things? Yes, that, this kind of work is, is very much what Chambers excel at and especially the, the results that have come from the Quadrilla work with the Chambers of Commerce have now achieved nearly £7 million of direct and indirect spend with our companies. And it is this, this kind of speed dating arrangement, but it, it isn't random. It's really understanding what the industry needs and finding the right suppliers to sit with them and talk about it and try and match them up so you know that you've got serious economic benefit from those events. And what sort of reaction have you had to supporting the shale gas industry in this way? Very positive from our businesses. That's what we're there for, is to work with those companies, with those engineering firms. A lot of them are in aerospace, in automotive, and these industries have really long contracting periods and supply chains and if you know if the if the sector is disrupted it can have serious impact on our company's ability to, to survive whereas shale gas and other areas around low carbon and and different energy production techniques locally give them a, a, a diversification income they can get into this field and keep themselves sustained in the in energy industry for you know many decades has that been your experience as well oh absolutely you know this is only the beginning of the development of a, su a supply chain in Lancashire. You know, if we can get a supply chain that can actually supply everything to this particular industry, you know, that first mover advantage that can then be used to deliver, you know, supplies and products to the UK shale industry. Mm. That's what we want so to do. So you see that that is the, the next steps in this? Absolutely. Do you? Yes, when the industry first moved into the area, the predominance of the supply chain came from Europe because that's where the, the historically those components have been made. So we've literally been sitting down with Cadrilla and team to work through the different components to look where there are opportunities for our companies in Lancashire and the North West to supply. Now, you're enthusiastic about this, but what would you say to some of those companies that are humming and hawing about whether to get involved? I would say it's like anything in business. First, find out what you might be missing out on. So come along, put yourself forward, look at your component, your manufacturing capabilities, and see if they match up. 
if you find an opportunity in the market, then you can decide if you want to capitalise on it. Because it is a high-profile project. It has attracted a lot of attention, hasn't it? It has, but the vast majority of our membership, and in our case, 1,600-plus members, are in full support of this industry becoming established for Lancashire. And I guess that's exactly the same proportion as what um, East Lancashire is um, experiencing too. There's a massive appetite out there from businesses for this industry to get established. They see the opportunities. These, they see the opportunities for the labour market. They see the opportunities for themselves, and they see the opportunities for the economy as a whole. Has it been easy to convince people? It's easy to convince them that they shouldn't be missing out on an economic opportunity. These are business people. This is, this is their bread and butter. Is, is there an op opportunity for me to learn about? Now, you've won a national award, haven't you? Yes, well, our chamber won a national award. The team and the board and the council and everybody that's really been involved with it. I, I was fortunate to go up on stage to receive that on behalf of everyone. But yes, we were presented with the British Chambers of Commerce Best Campaign. Award. For the whole country? For the whole country, mm -hmm. against you know very strong... Uh, competitions, so we were absolutely delighted and honoured. And what was this for specifically? For best campaigning. Th this is really where the Chamber does step up in terms of representing the business community, and we've done that in a number of ways over the last four to five years in representing what the businesses want in terms of, you know, should this industry be established? How can it be established? What are the opportunities of that establishment? And all of that was recognised in November of last year. Proud of it? Extremely proud of her. She's had to put up with an awful lot. It's, as you say, it's a high profile campaign. And Babs has been responsible for driving that with her team throughout Lancashire. It's very important. Thank you both very much indeed. So we've heard from the Chambers of Commerce about what they're doing to support the exploration work of Quadrilla. Now we're off to see some local suppliers about what they're doing to help the work at Preston New Road. I'm now at Longridge, outside the headquarters of Obas. They're a construction supplier, and I'm going inside to see what part they play in Lancashire's shale gas industry. With me now is Norman Tenray, who's the boss of Obas. How did you become involved in Quadrilla? I've been involved in this project for the last three to four years, primarily with my connections with the Chamber of Commerce. But as soon as they launched the shale gas portal, we quickly registered because we're excited about the opportunity. Now, the actual products you produce, we've seen stitching of the Quadrilla logo onto overalls. What else do you supply? We've got 17,000 products that we supply nationally to the construction industry. For Quadrilla specifically, what we do is supply a range of personalised clothing, safety equipment and PPE. And how's the contract gone along over the years that you've been involved? It's been great. They've lived up to their uh, promise of buying locally. Um, it's a commercial contract like any other contract, so we've just got to be respectful and we work hard to make sure we deliver what we promise we're going to deliver. Now, really importantly, this is a high-profile project. What would your advice be to other firms in Lancashire? My advice would be don't be scared. It is a high-profile um, contract. It is something that you know has great opportunity for the Lancashire community in terms of job creation, um, which we so desperately need in Lancashire. So I would urge any business to get involved. But fundamentally, it is a commercial relationship where one has to be respectful that it's got to be, you know, uh, financially viable to both parties, and that they have to deliver to tight deadlines. So I would say get involved. It's a, a great opportunity for business, but in essence, it is a contract like any other contract that you're dealing with. So get involved, and it, you know, it could be a great facility for your business. Norman, thank you very much indeed. And now we're going to reflect with another guest all the variety of things that are being supplied on this project. It isn't just engineering firms that have become involved with Quadrilla. I'm now with uh, Damien Hayes, a former soldier who now works with Abbey Telecoms, who are based in Blackburn. How did you get involved with the project? Um, I was the original engineer that went into the offices that uh, Quadrilla acquired when they moved to the northwest. 
Um, I, I installed the, the network infrastructure there um, and the telephony solution. Um, and, then, and then you went on to Preston New Road and did some work there? Yeah, we've done some work up at the drill site at Kirkham as well, um, which has been more, again, network infrastructure, uh, Wi-Fi and such things like that. It's quite interesting this because people sort of think about drilling and all that sort of heavy engineering side of things, but this is just as much a sort of technological enterprise, isn't it? Of course, yeah. I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, Quadrilla is a business uh, and they do need some form of technical infrastructure in place to be able to operate, um, telephony, um, data, IT and such. So, yeah. And what's it been like working with them? How have you found it? Um, they've been a really, a really good customer, to be honest. Um, from my point of view, I can only speak from my point of view, um, from an engineering uh, perspective, the health and safety um, whilst on site is, is second to none. Uh, we work widely with a lot of different manufacturers, uh, food environments, automotive, many different kinds of, in, um, of in infrastructures around the UK. Um, and to be fair, they're up there with the best when it comes to health and safety, I've got to say that. Damien, thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to have our question and answer session. Well, after seeing all those businesses supporting this project, we're back here for your next round of questions with Laura. And we've had a question in from John, uh, and he's really um, can see around us people working on this site. And he wants to know how many people working on this site are actually from Lancashire. Oh, um, I would estimate probably about half of the people um, on site at any time are from Lancashire, including myself. Um, we've, yeah, got uh, a mixed a mixed crew. Um, we've got some people who are from uh, overseas. Um, the majority of people from the UK, and yeah, about probably about half of them from Lancashire. Now, uh, this is a sort of technical question. Silica sand is used in hydraulic fracking. Um, a questioner wants to know where does this silica sand come from? So the sand that uh, that we use, we use that in the fracturing, um, and, and it's um, termed propant, and that holds the, the fractures open to a certain extent. It's just standard sand, like you find on a beach, but it's actually uh, quarried in the northwest of the UK. Uh, a question from another John, um, and this concerns sort of the the, the safety requirements uh, of your suppliers. Obviously, Quadrilla control their own safety and there's a very high priority but what sort of requirements do you put on contractors contracting with you? Oh that's a very important uh, um, element for us and as we're evaluating and selecting suppliers to, to work with we look at their environmental and safety performance so uh, we go through a process called pre-qualification where companies uh, need to submit to us lots of information about how they manage their environmental and safety performance um, and then we uh, we work with the suppliers we audit them to ensure that they they are doing what they say they're doing because we need to ensure that the standards are maintained uh, you know on supplier sites and that the people who come onto our site know how to operate to the standards that we need to maintain People who've been following these webcasts will remember that in the past we've looked at uh, core samples that you, you took, I, I <laughs> guess probably back end of last year you took some core samples. Are you, are you still doing core samples? No, not now. The coring was done in the vertical pilot hole and we cut about 100 metres length of, of core. Um, that now is enough for us to be able to go and do the evaluation that we need to understand where to place the horizontal drains. So no more coring for the moment. I'm, I'm just uh, getting another question and I can't quite hear it. I'm just hoping that someone will tell me. Ah, right, OK. This, is, this concerns the horizontal drilling mm -hmm. and uh, the question is, what's the data telling you as you, as you do the horizontal work? So, um, we, uh, we, in the horizontal, we get information from the, the tools, the, the electronics and the sensors that are in, the, um, uh, in the, what we call the bottom hole assembly, so the tools that are just behind the drill bit. They're looking to measure the properties of the rock so um, the, the strength of the rock, how brittle it is, um, how easy it is to drill, all, all of those things that will give us information about how to then um, optimise the next phase of the operation. And we also get some information about the gas in the rock as well. And we sort of, sort of start to see the, the first glimpse of information about that, that fluid that's actually contained in the rock. 
There's obviously media coverage of protest activity around this site. I mean, what effect, if any, is it having on you? So, you know, we, we have the luxury of being able to plan our operations well in advance, make sure that we have the materials and the equipment on site to do the operation. So largely, if there's disruption um, at, the, at the entrance to our site, for example, we can um, more often than not continue our operations as planned. Um, but we, of course, we have to be extremely careful when there are people uh, uh, protesting uh, around the entrance uh, and people, you know, close to the public highway we have to be, make sure that we're moving extremely carefully on and off the site um, so we have to you know focus in that area and make sure that we are maintaining our operations and, and we are keeping a uh, keeping everybody everybody safe and now this is it. in our first set of questions this afternoon we were looking at the sort of the ultimate look of the site when the gas mm -hmm. is flowing but I think this is a question about what we can immediately expect in terms of changes on this site in the next say couple of months so the drilling rig will be here um, until we've finished the second well um, and then yeah, the drilling rig with its tall mast will go away and the equipment that we're going to use for hydraulic fracturing will arrive. That's mainly um, water storage tanks, the sand handling equipment and large pumping units. Um, that will then be here for the duration of the fracturing, which of course is only quite a small proportion of the overall operation. Um, when that's, uh, that's completed, that equipment will go away and we'll have the well test facilities, which are some low-lying, uh, quite, quite small-sized process vessels um, that allow the gas to then flow to surface and then be monitored, to be measured, to be tested. And then in the early, early stages of that testing, that gas will then be flared on site, which is enclosed burning. Uh, we've got a question now which I think sort of relates to the experience that we had a, a few weeks ago with that long spell of cold weather. Uh, everyone, I think, became very conscious about the energy mix in this country between <laughs> renewables and traditional uh, uh, things. I think this question is really about the place, how important is the place of natural gas uh, in the UK economy mix uh, into the foreseeable future? Well, uh, as we talked about earlier, um, you know, renewables are making great strides forward and, and there's all sorts of promising technologies that's going to help us move away from hydrocarbons for transportation, for example. But you need fuel um, that's going to be a, a continuous supply in the background, a fuel that you can turn up or down as weather changes, um, and something that's going to be part of a sustainable energy mix. And, and I would argue that, that gas is part of that mix. It's, it's lower carbon than other fossil fuels, and it's a good way of complementing renewable electricity generation. Um, so, you know, as, as mentioned earlier on, you know, studies are indicating, and I think almost unanimously, people agree that there is a strong place for gas um, up to 2050 and beyond. A question from Tony about the importance of getting a, a trial drilling permit for the future. Um, I think I've heard that right. Sorry, I. No. Um, the, 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 the proof of, of, of trial, the proof of trial drilling. Um, how important is that for you in terms of drilling into a uh, safe trial drilling in terms of uh, future uh, future drilling for quadrilla? So perhaps Tony is referring then to the you know the purpose of this exploration activity and the fact that that's maybe proving the concept of uh, how we can drill the shale for the future. Um, and, and that's critical, I mean that's what we're here to do in this exploration operation. So we're demonstrating that uh, technically we can put a horizontal well into the, into the shell below our feet. We're proving that at the surface we can conduct this operation in line with the, the permits and the planning conditions that we've got. We're proving that you know, we can conduct it with the scrutiny of the regulatory authorities. We're proving to ourselves that we can do it at the sort of the costs we're, that we're expecting and the kind of in the time frame that we're expecting. And I think all of those pieces fit together in, in what I'd call a proof of concept for, for, shale, uh, for shale drilling. And that's really what we need to then be able to take forward and say, so knowing this, this is what shale development could look like in the future. We've got a lot of questions today about what the future sort of look of the of the site's going to be, which which prompts me to ask um, about your relations with the immediate local community over the last period. What's that been like? 
Well, we've got a constant dialogue with the local community. Um, individuals have the ability to contact us at any time through a, through an inquiries line. We have a strong uh, ongoing conversations with uh, the uh, the local leadership of, of the councils. Um, for example, I'm, I'm part of the Quadrilla delegation who meet as part of the community liaison group on a monthly basis, where we sit with community representatives and leaders uh, and the police and the regulatory authorities to do, discuss what's going on, to discuss progress from everybody's perspective in relation to the operations, to talk about issues and concerns, information sharing. Uh, and I think that's actually going very well. People want to understand what's happening here on the site. We want to give people the visibility of, of what we're doing here so that yeah, we, we all experience that proof of concept, actually. So I'm very pleased with the way that that dialogue is working. And, and I think this is going to have to be the last question, but clearly this recent cold spell has concentrated questioners' minds today. I mean, the last question is, you know, I mean, the use of the word crisis, I mean, is, is the gas supply industry in this country in, in crisis, would you say? Well, uh, as I said earlier on, I think there's a number of elements that have come together recently. We've got a, a, a dramatic reduction in gas storage in the UK. We've had problems with the supply from Europe and we've had um, very high demand. And all of those things really focus the mind on the fact that we have to do something about our energy st stability so that we can carry on you know, in the comfort that we've got um, in this country and grow our economy in the way that we want to. Laura, you've been an absolute trooper today answering all these questions. Thank you very much indeed. And thanks to you all for, for your questions. Let me just give you that Earl uh, again that you can get in touch with us. It's www.shalegaslancashire.co.uk. So uh, thanks to all of you for taking part. Uh, we'll be back with another webcast later in the spring. In the meantime, from Laura and myself, uh, happy Easter and thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you.